Hey, good morning, Tracy Community Church. We are so happy you've joined us this morning online. We have some exciting news that we want to let you know about. Next Sunday, we are going to be outside at 9 a.m. for another outdoor service. We would love it if you would join us at that time. If you choose to join us, could you do us a favor? Could you bring us a bag of candy for our fall festival that's going to be happening on October 31st? It's going to serve, serve the community here in Tracy. Make sure that bag has individually wrapped candy inside of it, and you can drop it off when you walk in. We would greatly appreciate that. Some more exciting news is after that outdoor service, we're going to go back inside to open back up for indoor services on the 18th. Those services are going to happen at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. So we have two services, one at 9 a.m., one at 11 a.m. We hope that you would join us. If you still don't feel comfortable, you can always join us online. We will be online for every Sunday here on out. Thank you so much for joining us. And would you please join us in a time of worship now? You can stand, you can sit, however you choose to worship. If you have small children at home like me, you can chase your children around the house while you listen to worship songs and praise the Lord. Uh, but before we start, let me open us in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to join together online virtually as a community. Uh, Lord, even though we are distant still, would we still feel like we are a part of a greater community by being able to worship you as one body in Christ? We thank you so much for this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy this time of worship.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. So holy, and holy, there is no one. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, so holy, holy, there is
on a rock. The floods came. You know the story. But his house couldn't be shaken. It was still standing. Because the foundation that he built it on was made to last. Life can throw a lot of things at us. And more likely than not, it never goes the way we want it to according to our plan. And it's in those times of uncertainty that can reveal where we put our trust. But that song reminds us that God invites us to put our faith, to put our trust in him, to let him be our firm foundation. He is our anchor to the ground. He said that he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us, and no matter what you've done, his love cannot be moved. Today, with everything going on in the world, and you might feel like you're just trying to keep your head above that water. And I just want to remind you that he's there for you. He's right under you, trying to push you up, keep you above that, that wave. Lots of times you try to do it alone, but he didn't make it so that we do it alone. So this morning, I just encourage you to build your life, to make Jesus your foundation, to make him the center, where that no matter what comes our way, we won't be moved, we won't be swayed, because he's there holding us up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you don't, that we don't have to do it alone, Lord God. This morning I just pray that wherever we are, that we would just put our trust in you. Wherever we're lacking, God, that you would be. Help us to trust you, God. To let go of of what we want to control and to let you do what you want to do, God. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you even when we don't know, God. You still know and you are still good. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. Thank you, Jesus. This week, just remind us. Reveal something new in us, Lord God. That we don't know about you, Lord Jesus. Help us to dig deeper. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. Good morning, Tracy Community Church. Thank you for tuning in today, uh, joining with us online for these next few moments. I hope you entered into the worship, that time of worship, uh, not just like listen to the music or just kind of said some words, but you actually entered in and engaged with the worship because worship is so powerful in so many dimensions, right? So many different ways, uh, 
one of the big things is it kind of ascribes worth to God, and we're telling God who, reminding ourselves who God is, because oftentimes we kind of get caught up in our little world and what's going on in our life, but worship just reminds us like, oh yeah, he is a good, good father. Absolutely. Even when life is in good, situations aren't good, and sometimes when people aren't good, God, you remain good, and we just need to be reminded of that, and worship kind of gets the focus off ourself. And onto God, where it really needs to be, and 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 I concur with what Jessica just prayed about, you know, building our lives on the rock, because life and storms and situations are going to beat against us. There, there are no guarantees it's going to be smooth sailing. It's going to be rough. I think we've already noticed that. But when we build our lives, or as Jesus said, when we put His words into practice, it's just like the wise builder who built his house on a rock, and it will stand, and it will withstand through everything life throws at it. So it really is, it does come down to the putting his words into practice, actually doing what he says he, we should do. In fact, that will lead and segue into what we're going to talk about this morning as we open again with this big idea of love your neighbor. Three big words, three powerful words, and three words I didn't come up with, Three words that Jesus himself said to us, love your neighbor. And the context for that was that uh, uh, a guy came to Jesus. Actually, he was an expert in the law, and he was asking Jesus a question, but trying to trip Jesus up. It's found in the book of Matthew where he approaches Jesus, and he just says this, okay, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And everybody knew in that culture, in that time, that God had rules. God had things you had to do. They were non-negotiables, right? That's why it's called a command. What's the greatest command? They were used to this. They came out of Egypt. They were given the Ten Commandments. They had all of these rules. And this guy says, okay, let's just cut to the chase. What's the big one? What's the most important one? What is most important to God? And then Jesus' response has been immortalized, right? When he said these words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, or the second is the co-greatest. They are of equal value. Love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, Jesus would go on and say, all the laws of the prophets, all the laws in the Old Testament, everything hinges and hangs on this command. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. In other words, if we get this right, things go right. If we don't get this right, nothing goes right. It's that big of a deal. It can never just kind of fade away. It can never just go to the back of the line. It's the number one thing. It's the highest priority. This guy says, okay, what's most important to God? And Jesus goes, let me tell you what's most important to God. Love him. Love him with everything. Don't just give a token, I love God. Oh, yeah. Hey, God. Hey, how you doing? No, love him with your heart and with your soul and with your mind, how you process things, how you see things, how you see the world and see the life. Just make sure that this vertical relationship, you are giving and expressing our love to God, but don't keep it there. Don't just stay right there because the vertical has to go horizontal. It has to go, uh, we have to, uh, has to be doable. It has to be authenticated. Our love for God is authenticated by our love for our neighbor, how well we love our neighbors, right? And last week, we, we discovered, if we, we probably already knew this, but we looked at that word neighbor was bigger than just the people in our neighborhood, It includes them, but it's bigger than that. It's everyone in our orbit, everyone in our life, everyone we'll ever come eyeball to eyeball with, right? It's everyone. It's just the human race. So Jesus goes, do you want to know what's at the top of God's list? Do you want to know what's number one? Yeah, love him, love God, absolutely. But take that love and begin to love and demonstrate that love for God by the way you love your neighbor, And so we are spending a couple of weeks talking about this command made by Jesus because I think we're living in a time, a time in history, where we really need this command, where we really need to live out this command, like right now, right? And there's probably never been a time in our church where we needed more clarity on how we're going to apply this command in our current culture like we do now. We need clarity on the common ground we're going to stand on together as a church and as people, no matter 
what happens, no matter what comes our way. And, I, and we don't just need clarity. I think we just need some help, right? I mean, this command to love our neighbor is said so often, read so often, that it almost feels like just a little cutesy cliche. But my goodness, the more I look into my heart, the more I look into the world, the more I look at what's going on, the less cute this command actually sounds, right? And the more desperate, the more desperate we really are for it, the more, the more uh, amazing this command, the more revolutionary it feels, the more profound it seems. We are desperate for this to be unleashed into our lives, church, a world, right? And I hope there are other people listening today, watching today, who are desperate, just like I am, to see this love your neighbor come alive and not just be pages on a book, but to be how we do life. So we're looking at two things, two things, um, two things that I think that, that, that this command requires, two things that actually define this command to love our neighbor, two things that if we were to actually do them, that it would take the, this command off the pages of the Bible and begin to un, and, and move them into our hearts and into our homes and into our lives and uh, into our streets and, and schools and cities and hopefully even into our culture, right? Two things that have the power to move us individually or collectively in the direction of and keep us in the place of, and maybe help others move in the direction of, and help them plant in the soil of, yeah, love your neighbor. So here are the two things, right? Two things. First is about the way we think. The second is about what we do. And we talked about how we think or the way we think last week, and we looked at these amazing truth that the Apostle Peter gave us out of the book of First Peter when he, when he reminded all of us that we're all made in the image of God, that we're all made in the image of God. We are, all, uh, we, we are also someone that Jesus died for. Everyone is someone. Everyone is made in God's Im image. In other words, we don't get to assign value to people. We don't get to define their value. It's already been defined. It's already been assigned by God himself. We have intrinsic value because we are made in the image of God. Every person you will run across today, tomorrow, throughout your life, no matter how you feel towards them, no matter what they do or say, they are made in the image of God. And Peter reminds us, and they have been given the possibility to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to see people differently than we, the way that we see them. It takes a change, or as Paul would say, a renewing of our mind. So in every situation, every scenario we're in, we are reminded, you are someone, you are someone made in the image of God. You are someone that Jesus died for. Now this week, I, I want to move on to the second truth. It's not just a, 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 a thought pattern to embrace. It's, it's a call to commit to a course of action. And the context for this is critical. The context for this is crucial. And the passage we're going to look at is found in the book of Luke, actually in Luke chapter 10. And in this setting, in this setting um, Jesus is talking to a crowd. And as he's talking, sure enough, the subject matter of what's most important to God pops up, comes up. And I'm sure, as Jesus did a lot, like everywhere he went, he affirms the greatest commandment, to love God, love your neighbor. And this time, just like last time, an expert of the law is there to try to trip him up, right? So he, he's coming to, and he's going to kind of try to spar with Jesus a little bit, kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. And can I suggest, never a good idea. He's going to try it anyway. So instead of just saying, okay, you're right, Jesus, you got to love God and love your neighbor. He just pushes it a little further and asks Jesus a follow-up question. So what we're about to read happens immediately and in response to the greatest command. Love God, love your neighbor. But he's not going to take that one, that neighbor thing. That was bothering him. So he's kind of looking for a loophole. So he says, but he, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, um, and who is? my neighbor. And you can almost hear the challenge in the, in, in the question, right? Yeah, I get it. I'm an expert in the law, so I know. 
loving God, super important, got to do it. It's got, but like, like, who are we talking about when you say neighbor? Because here's my neighbor, Fred. Are we talking about Fred? He's my neighbor, and we have some good days and not so good days. So when you say neighbor, exactly, define exactly what you mean by neighbor. And it's in response to this guy that Jesus did something he did frequently. He takes everyone and makes everyone Super uncomfortable, right? He takes your takes your neighbor um, and takes and talks about your neighbor in the hardest possible context, and he gives us the parable of the good Samaritan, and that's the parable that we're going to look at together for the next just few minutes today. And I got to warn you, what happened to me might actually happen to you. You might be caught off guard by this parable as we dive into it. I mean, we hear the term. Good Samaritan all the time. And I'm telling you, the story that Jesus actually tells around it, so rich, so real. And when you actually study it, it has the potential to hit you really hard, like a ton of bricks. I mean, like rock your world. I'm telling you, it did mine. But I'm honored and I'm humbled to stand and talk to you and, and teach out of this big idea in community together. So we're going to listen to, the, to Jesus illustrate for us in dramatic and creative fashion what it means to love your neighbor. And remember, this isn't just about thinking something or even feeling something. This is about doing. In fact, I think Jesus is going to give us a to-do list today. The to-do list of what it actually means to love your neighbor. And listen, I think if we don't do this list, if we don't fulfill this list, we're not going to fulfill this command. I mean, we can think the way that Jesus wants to think all day long, but I think unless we do this, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it completely. And I believe it's why he positioned the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, 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 next to and, and an ex explanation of what it looks like to actually love your neighbor. So here's the list. I'm just going to give it to you right off the gate, right out of the gate, right? So that we can move ahead and set up camp on the ground of and the soil of love your neighbor. First, there's a need to notice. And then there's a barrier to break through. And there will always be a price to pay. If we're going to be the kind of people or we're going to be the kind of church that, that loves our neighbor as Jesus is commanding us to, intends us to, there will always be needs that we have to be aware of, that we have to be in the habit of noticing. There will be barriers and probably barriers, plural, that we're going to have to find the courage and the strength that God provides to break through. And there will always be a price to pay. There will always be a price that we'll have to be willing to pay. So let's start with the need to notice. And this is where Jesus launches into this super famous parable. Look at this, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So just to be clear, this is a Jewish man. He just left Jerusalem. He's heading towards Jer Jericho. He is beaten. He is stripped naked of all of his clothes. He is, he is bleeding. He's unconscious. And most likely, he would be dead by nightfall. Jesus, right out of the gate, right at the beginning, begins to focus us in on a need, a neighbor in need. Remember, that's what this story is all about. Then the applied question to us would be, okay, do you see? And it may not be as dramatic as this guy, but do you see that neighbor in need? Because this is what this commandment requires first, right? That the, this, this thing that's most important to God, love God, and then take that love by how you express it, by loving your neighbor, means you've got to notice, you've got to pay attention to the need. It means noticing the family down the street who's going through some financial hardship. It means noticing that coworker who lets slip that one of their family members is sick. It means noticing uh, that, 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 that kid whose parents are going through a divorce. It means maybe noticing kids in our school system who are, who are facing food scarcity. And maybe it's noticing the homeless person that sits there with that sign day after day after day. 
It means noticing anyone who is in need or in danger or at risk of being taken advantage of. It means noticing anyone who's been exposed in any way to harm or injustice, degradation. Church, have you noticed the neighbor in need in this season of global pandemic? Are you just looking at your needs or do you see the needs of others that are going on all around you? Have you noticed the neighbor in need in the season of racial tragedies, right? Jesus is saying loving your neighbor means you got to notice their needs. And I believe he paints this picture for us because it's not a given that we're going to notice, at least not in any way that leads to any solutions or leads into any action. So it's not a given that we're going to notice, not in our day, and evidently not in their day either, because that's the story that Jesus tells. That's how this narrative plays out. Remember, this story by Jesus, he tells it on purpose, for a purpose. It's carefully constructed by Jesus so that we can see something not about the characters in the story, but about our lives, right? He continues, a priest happened to be going down the same road. Well, thank God, man of God of power, right? And when he saw the man, he passed on by the other side. A priest, and if you're not sure what that is, maybe in our day it would be more like a pastor, right? But in their day for sure was the man who made sacrifices for the sins of the Jewish people in, the, in, in, in their temple. In other words, he was someone who, who was kind of the, who mediated the relationship between God and them at the temple. He was a shepherd. He was a guide. He was a teacher. He was actually a good man. He would be at the top of the list of good in their community. And he comes upon, this man becomes a, comes upon a dying man, one of his own countrymen. And, but somehow he just walks on by. Perhaps he had some urgent business for God. Perhaps he thought this guy was already dead, and, and for him to touch a dead person would mean he would be ceremonially unclean, and he would have to, you know, spend a substantial amount of his time isolated, and he couldn't do the work of God or serve God in the temple. Perhaps he thought someone else would come along in a minute or two, and he'd be more qualified than him. We don't know, but we do know he just walked on by. He saw the situation. He just turned a blind eye. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. And a Levite was also someone who worked in the temple system in ancient Judaism. So think more like someone maybe for us, like a church staff member, right? And he comes upon the same scenario, same guy, and for reasons we can only guess because we really don't know, he too just walks on by. He sees the situation, and just like the priest, he goes to the other side of the street. And I think when Jesus says this, he wants us to be bothered by this, right? And not so that we can go, ha ha, I told you, all religious people, phonies, I told you, look at the story Jesus sees. No, it's not about that. It's not so that we can point fingers and criticize these guys and say they're bad people. No, these were just normal people. I mean, one of them was a priest. These were good men. And that's the part that should bother us, right? That there, there really is no difference. They're no different than us. That we're all susceptible to the same exact thing that they were. Listen, good people will always find and be able to find good reasons to walk on by. Good people will always be able to find good reasons just to keep walking, reasons that make sense, reasons that if anyone, if you were to hear them, you would go, yeah, that makes perfect sense, right? I get it. I mean, you saw it, you understand it, and you felt bad like I felt bad, but I totally understand why you can just walk on by. You got things to do. You got places to be. You, you know, maybe you got a church thing you got to be involved in, which, by the way, I thought it was interesting that Jesus made their profession around the temple. Maybe he cares more about us getting this right than just going to church, right? Maybe he cares more about us being in the church than just going. Maybe. So number one, there's a need to notice. Let's move on to the second thing. And it's here where the protagonist of the story is revealed. The one who notices and the one who actually stops walking. The one who actually does something. 
And the character Jesus chooses to use as the lead guy is incredibly, incredibly controversial. In fact, I think if you and I had been in the audience in that first century audience, we'd been listening in that culture in that time, we'd been listening to Jesus, we would immediately would have begun to argue with Jesus when he was done. And most likely some of us would have tweeted something snarky or we would have posted something on Facebook, all these stats while he was talking. But listen to me, Jesus wasn't trying to make his audience feel comfortable. He was doing the complete opposite. He was trying to make his audience feel very, very uncomfortable, like on purpose uncomfortable. He was trying to pull his audience out of their comfort zone, beyond their current standard, beyond their current version of love your neighbor that they had so, so carefully constructed. And in in doing that, Jesus brings in a Samaritan. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And this is probably where Jesus' audience began to groan. Oh, no. I started rolling. I mean, heads started shaking back and forth. Frustration started rising. Arguments started being formed. Why? Well, Jews and Samaritans were not friendly neighbors. Their bad relationship had actually been going on for centuries It went all the way back to the time when Israel was split between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It's like in the ninth century, King Omri uh, made Samaria. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, in direct opposition to Jerusalem, which was the capital of the southern kingdom in Judah. A national divide a national conflict, and a national divide and conflict became a spiritual divide when they built a temple in Samaria to a foreign god, and it became the center of idolatry in defiance to the temple that was built in Jerusalem for the one true God. So there's a national divide, a spiritual divide, then became a racial division because Assyria evaded northern kingdom And the Jews living in Samaria began to intermarry with Assyrians, which was an absolute no, no, no at the time, right? And now the pure Jewish blood became tainted with foreigners, and they, from that point on, would be considered half-breeds, hated. So I don't want you to miss the mess that Jesus has created when he, on purpose, placed the Samaritan as the good guy. I mean, there's centuries of resentment. There's centuries of conflict. There's centuries of racial prejudice. If only Jesus could tell a story more relevant to our times, right? I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it's crazy. But that's the context for the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' illustration of what it means to love your neighbor is filled with national, spiritual, and racial division. Why? Because he wanted us to understand a second yet so profound point that there's not just a need to notice, there's a barrier or probably barriers to break through. I mean, just think about the barriers that this Samaritan had to break through to help this Jewish neighbor. He had to break through the barrier of comfort, right? He was going somewhere and now he had to stop where he was going. Uh, This guy was dirty and bleeding and sweating and just nasty. I mean, this guy, this guy is like, ooh, ooh, I don't want to be around this guy. And he had to break through the barrier of social norms. I mean, did I mention this guy was naked on on the side of the road, unconscious, awkward, awkward, right? He had to break through the barriers of patriotism, like you were enemies, you represent everything that's wrong with this country. He had to break through the barriers of religion, our belief system. Yeah, not even close, buddy. He had to break through barriers of status. All you Jews think you're better than us Samaritans. He had to break through barriers of racial prejudices, just like uh, all this animosity, uh, suspicions, and stereotypes, right? Each of these men had centuries of that, stories about that, experiences that validated that, talking points, narratives, grudges between them because of all of that. I'm telling you, the barriers between these two men were monumental, insurmountable. They were catastrophic. And yet, 
the Samaritan breaks through. Back to the story. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, look at he took pity on him. He didn't move to the other side of the road. Something began to stir on the inside. Something on the inside helped him notice to actually lead to action to help this guy. Three men walked by, and only one actually loves his neighbor. Why? Because he noticed the need, and he broke through all of these really hard barriers. So let me ask you a question. What barriers have traditionally kept you from loving some of your neighbors? Because it's one thing to read a story. It's one thing to hear a message. It's one thing to nod and agree. That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole different thing to identify the barriers in our own life, right? And listen, throughout this time, if any of them surface, listen, don't, don't feel guilty or judged or attacked. Listen, we all have them. Remember, remember in our story that the, the, the priest, the priest, listen, this guy was a good guy. He, he, was a, he, had, he had good intentions. He was probably on his way home from church because he came from Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. This was a good man. Evidently, he had some barriers. And that was Jesus' point. He's telling us this amazing story because he intends for all of us to individually identify identify those barriers and call them out. Don't call them out in somebody else. Don't identify them in somebody else, right? I mean, Jesus said, listen, get the log out of your eye before you help your brother or sister get the speck of dust out of theirs. Identify and call out the barriers in your life because until we call them out and identify them, we won't even know what they are, right? And we can't break through them. And I would suggest, maybe just from personal experience, that the greatest challenge to loving our neighbor is usually our own baggage, right? It's usually our baggage, not our bank account. I mean, we usually can, we usually have our collectively, we can find the resources to help our neighbor. So that's not normally our challenge. Usually the greatest challenge is breaking through all the other stuff, you know, like, discomfort, or like inconvenience, or the pain of sacrifice, or the complexity of a problem, or the messiness of a situation, or the history of all the conflicts, all the insults, mistakes, and wrongs that led to the conflict to begin with, or the extreme differences, the differences of opinions, or or appearance, or the political narratives that have built and built and built and have been hyped, hyped, hyped by the media. Those things and so, so many more are usually our greatest challenges. And listen, we all have barriers. But if we're going to love our neighbor as Jesus is commanding us to, yeah, it's going to require a breakthrough. So first, there's a need to notice. Secondly, there's a break barrier or barriers to break through. And finally, there will always be a price to pay. And that's exactly what the Samaritan does. Back to the story. He went, he, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an innkeeper, and said, look after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Listen, he noticed the need, right? But then he broke through the barrier, and then he began to pay the price so his neighbor could get better. And not only did he use his own medical supplies, he put him on his own mode of transportation. He took him to the nearest hotel. He opened up a tab, and he says, listen, if, if this costs you more money than I've given you, just put it on my tab. Put it on me, and I'll pay it. Gladly pay it when I get back. And guys, according to Jesus, that's what we're called to do if we're actually going to love our neighbor. Because loving our neighbor means paying the price. Each of us is called to pay the price for our neighbor's healing. And I think at this point, at this point, Jesus' audience is silent. Convicted. Cut to the heart. I imagine they're standing there, sitting there, maybe like we are right now, contemplating their own lives, thinking about their own neighbors. And then Jesus drives the dagger in even deeper with the question. Which of these three do you think 
was a neighbor to the man who fell into the, fell into the hands of the robber. Again, silence, convicting silence. And finally, the guy who started it off with a question, the guy who wanted to spar with Jesus, the guy who got, got knocked out in the first round, if you will, the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, the one who noticed the need, the one who broke through these barriers, the one who paid the price. And then Jesus ends with these four powerful words. Go and do likewise. Go and do. Don't just sit and talk about it. Don't just sit and talk yourself out of it. Go and do likewise. Do you know what's going to get the command to love your neighbor off the pages of the Bible into our hearts, into our homes, into our cities and streets and maybe schools, community, and culture? People who are going and doing likewise. Committing to a course of action. Resolving to be a good Samaritan. Resolving to be people who see needs. Resolving to be people who break through barriers. Resolving to be people who are willing to pay the price for their neighbor's healing. Now, I don't know where all of this lands with you. But for me, these words from Jesus are so convicting and so powerful, right? And isn't it true that wherever you, whoever you are, no matter where you stand on all of this stuff, don't, don't you want this to be true of your, of your community? I mean, if that was you lying in a ditch, if that was you with no way to make your life better, if that was you in that kind of position, wouldn't you want someone to come alongside you, notice your need, and break through any barriers and pay so that your life could be better? Wouldn't that one? I mean, I do. I absolutely do. But here's the deal, followers of Jesus. For us, this isn't hypothetical. For us, this is what we do. I mean, this isn't just a sad story with a happy ending that Jesus tells, tells us in the Bible. This is just supposed to be who we are. This is how people are to experience us in times like this. Because a good Samaritan isn't a term Jesus coined to describe heroes. It's a term he used to describe all Jesus followers. It's us. It's who we are. It's just what we do. We're the ones who pay the price. Whether it's a dollar amount, whether it's the cost of our time, the cost of our presence, the cost of our voice, the cost of our assistance, uh, our listening ear, our open arms. We're the people who notice the need, who break through the barriers, and we pay the price for our neighbor's betterment, right? That's who we are, at least. That's who we're supposed to be, right? Like, and that family on your street is going through a real struggle and everyone just walks on by, we stop and pay the price. Hey, what do you need? And what, what, what can I do? When, when that coworker lets slip about a family member who's gotten really sick and everybody else is just kind of moving on and life as usual, we stop. We pay the price. What do you need? What can I do? When that father of your kid's teammate gets, get, gets, gets, uh, gets a terrible diagnosis and everybody else just keeps moving, just keeps moving, maybe because they're so busy, life is already too complicated, can't deal with one more thing. We don't do that. We don't make excuses. We stop, we pay the price. What do you need? What can I do? When people are hungry, food is scarce. And, they, and, they, and we may feel sorry for them, but we just keep walking. Listen, we don't do that. We stop. We pay the price. Maybe we're the ones who bring the food. Maybe the, we're the ones who join with the other people or other organizations who have already stopped and paying the price. We join with them. When kids don't have a safe home to live in, and it seems like everyone is just ignoring and, and walking on by, we don't. We're the people who stop and pay the price. When a pandemic arises, we don't just shelter in place and wait for it to be safe. I mean, there are people who need meals. There's Red Cross who need blood. There are people around us who need courage. Everyone feels too stressed, too fearful, too overwhelmed to do anything but walk on by. We don't. We stop, and we pay the price for our neighbor's healing. 
When racism shows its ugly face, we are the people, we're not the people who walk on by. We're the people who stop and join the effort, pay the price for our neighbor's healing. We stand against it. We take criticism if we have to. We get uncomfortable if we have to. But what we don't do is turn a blind eye. We stand up with our voice and with our wallets and we say, when it comes to my orbit, when it comes to my neighbor, put it on my tab, put it on me. Whenever we see pockets of prejudice or patterns of injustice, we're not the people who walk on by or simply because it doesn't affect us directly. No, no, we're the people who break through the barriers. We, we are the people who wade into the mess. We are the people who join in the effort to pay the price for our neighbor's healing. And yes, we educate ourselves when we need to. We, we speak up when we need to. We lean in locally to whatever work needs to be done. Listen, we don't wait on someone else, right? Come on, we're the church. We're the Jesus followers. This is on us. We're the good Samaritans. This is about us. This is our time to do something, right? We open up a tab. We put our card down and say, hey, you're going to need some of this. How, what can I do and how can I help? And for that matter, when anyone anywhere at any time in the future is laying on the side of the road in need, as Jesus followers, we relish the opportunity to notice their need, to break through any and all barriers and pay the price for their healing. It's who we are. At least it's who we're supposed to be, right? Good Samaritan isn't a term that Jesus coined, coined to describe heroes. It's a term he used to describe any one who claims to be a Jesus follower. It's who we are. It's just what we do. Okay, listen, this is important. Just listen. I'm not saying there is a way. There is a way that you need to be doing this or that you need to be like me or you need to be like him or you need to be like her or them or any particular group. I'm not saying that. In fact, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of the body of Christ, right? That's the beauty of this body that we call the church. Every single one of us can move in the way we feel God is directing us to move, which can be as diverse as the color of our skin. It can be as diverse as our minds and our personalities, the way we're wired, the makeup of our gift mix and abilities. I think there, is, there are many options, so many options of loving your neighbor, except one. Not loving your neighbor, right? Not an option. The only thing that isn't an option is walking on by and doing nothing. Because doing something, or as Jesus put it, go and do likewise is what it means to love your neighbor. Like if loving your neighbor was like a car, the fuel in that engine is what we talked about last week. Everyone is someone. Everyone is someone that God made and Jesus died for. Everyone, he is someone God made and Jesus died for. She is someone God made and Jesus died for. That's the fuel for this love your neighbor vehicle. But come on, at some point in time, the car needs to go. The rubber needs to meet the road. And Jesus is letting all of us know the tires on the car, the vehicle of love your neighbor. Yeah, that's when we notice the need, break through the barrier and pay the price. And as we do, I believe we will be poised to make such a difference in this season of being in, 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 in a pandemic in this particular time of such racial tragedy. We're living in a season where, where isolation and division is on the rise. But we have this unbelievable opportunity to stay committed to the message, not only of our church, but the message of, that should be part of the mission that every Christ followers should be following, right? When Jesus, and I can't ever say this enough, when Jesus in the upper room said, a new command, a new way of doing business, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This would be the driving ethic for this new movement called the church. What if we didn't just repeat it, Read it. We should. What if we actually did it? What if we started living this out? What if we were actually going and doing likewise for every neighbor in our orbit? Right? So in closing, let me give you three questions to consider. 
You can consider them today or tomorrow, this week, individually with somebody else, or maybe in, in small group when you meet this week. Question number one, what, 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 did, what do you need to notice? What do you actually need to pay attention to? Everybody else is kind of walking on by. Everybody else is ignoring and moving on. But what do you need to notice? Secondly, what barrier or barriers do you need to break through? What are those barriers, right? Listen, don't call them out in somebody else. Call them out in your own life. Call them out and ask God to help you break them down. And then lastly, what price is Jesus asking you to pay for someone else's healing? I'm telling you, if you really want to see the command to love your neighbor get off the pages of the Bible and into your hearts, into our homes, streets, cities, hopefully even into our culture, if you want to see yourself or us collectively move in the direction of and stay in the place, plant on the soil of love your neighbor, then, as Jesus said, go and do likewise. Let's go be a good Samaritan. Again, Ask God to help you to notice needs. Wake up and pay attention to what's happening. And then lean heavily on the power of the Holy Spirit to break through any and all barriers. And then pay what you can toward the price of your neighbor's healing. Because that's what we do. Because that's who we are. Let me pray for you. Father, today I ask that you would... um, Take this story that Jesus said. Let it resonate in our hearts. That we won't just say, yeah, yeah, I know this story. But yeah, Lord, I want to live out this story. I I really want to be that person. I really want to be a part of a community of faith that lives this out on a daily basis. I I pray that first and foremost, there'll be heart changes in some of us. In fact, the word repent actually means a change of mind, that our minds would change to align with yours, and that as we love you with all of our heart and soul and mind, it would translate to how we love the neighbors, love the people in our orbit, love the people that you love. For God so loved the world that he did something about it. He gave his only son that these would just not be little lines out of Scripture that we learned maybe since we were children. These would be things that we actually believe to the point that we actually do. I pray that those four words would resonate within us this week. Go and do likewise. That we wouldn't go and ignore, that we wouldn't sit and forget. We would go and do likewise. See needs that we would actually break through any, all of our justification, this is why I don't, and all of our excuses, and maybe they're good ones. Break through the barriers and then pay the price so that our neighbors can be better. You choose us to be your hands and arms and legs and feet and voice. We're the body of Christ. Let, Let us be activated in this season, this time, that we're living in today. Help us. Strengthen us. And I pray God will actually do this. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Let's go and do